Hey, it's Kay. And this is Skittles, lead surgeon. Today we're going to talk about hit Netflix TV program, Squid Game. Now this probably won't shock you to hear, but this show has some things to say about capitalism. I was debating whether to tackle the basics of Squid Game's critique of capitalism, but with the biggest brains in media criticism putting out articles like this, I feel like it's worth covering. However, Squid Game is more than just a broad condemnation of an economic system, it is a reflection on the specific way capitalism manifests in South Korea, and the implications of that globally. But it does a little more than that, too. Before we talk about Squid Game, let's briefly circle back to a topic relevant to those poorly thought out articles from before. The USSR. In the early Soviet Union, there was a concept of a new Soviet man. A new kind of person who was skilled, healthy, and socially conscious. This was, in part, convenient propaganda, as this new kind of person would be a more productive and creative member of society than those before them. But it was also based in real social science. If we accept that people are brought low by poverty and desperation, that this deprives them of their health and the opportunities to develop skills and study, then it stands to reason that the society that communists were attempting to build would alleviate those problems, thus leading to a population who is healthier and better educated, as well as more socially minded. The new Soviet man, there are no women under communism, stood as a symbol of the ways that the individual could be improved and indeed liberated from the conditions that prevented them reaching their full potential. The contestants in Squid Game in many ways represent the exact opposite of this idea. They are poor, they're brought to violence by desperation and entirely at the mercy of those who possess wealth. The premise of the show is pretty straightforward. A mysterious and well-funded organization hosts a game show that targets people in desperate financial situations, so that they'll be willing to play games where the penalty for losing is death, to get a chance at an enormous amount of money. We're talking set-for-life money and then some. There it is, literally dangling over their heads in a golden piggy bank. It's very subtle. Something you might notice early on in this show is how the game makes the implicit violence of capitalism explicit. If you fail to adequately market your skills and your labor, or frankly if you just happen to be born in the wrong place or to a poor family, you could end up so destitute that you're certain to live a significantly shorter life than most. Or so desperate that you resort to crime, which could see you killed or effectively losing the rest of your life to imprisonment. In the game, however, those layers of causality are stripped back. And when you lose, a guy in a pink jumpsuit just shoots you in the face. It's so shockingly blunt that it almost comes back around to being funny. The juxtaposition of the silliness of a bunch of brightly colored watchdogs rejects murdering desperate people dressed in a way that brings to mind prisoners, or perhaps camp detainees, is really jarring and likely contributes to how much this show seems to be resonating with people. But those bright colors aren't just for memorable visuals. The entire facility that the game is played in resembles a primary school, adding to the humiliation of the contestants who aren't just risking their lives for a chance of getting out of poverty and debt, they're being treated like children. They're made to eat and sleep when ordered to. They ask questions, but their superiors ignore them, deciding what they do and do not need to know. Like children, or prisoners. Squid Game invites us to consider how similar the two can be, and how paternalistically we often look on those we deem inferior. But the contestants are not the only ones in prison. If the contestants are the poor, the desperate, the working class climbing over each other to succeed in a system that encourages ruthless competition, then what does that make these guys in the jumpsuits? This is your middle class, your managers, and the enforcers of the laws of the ruling class. 
As a Western viewer, we only get so much media from South Korea, so it's hard not to compare Squid Game to some of the work of director Bong Joon-ho, who, as I explore in my Snowpiercer video, is really grappling with the role that the middle class, particularly intellectuals, play in a capitalist system, and in movements that challenge that system. Not dissimilar to how Nam Goong is pulled out of a prison cell in Snowpiercer, the middle class in the game also also find themselves imprisoned. Despite spending their days literally destroying the lives of the people beneath them, every one of the pink jumpsuits ends their day in a cell. If the room the contestants stay in evokes a mass detainment facility not unlike the kinds used for refugees, the pink jumpsuits live in a much more private, classic prison cell. They eat the same prison food, but just a bit nicer. They're still under the control and surveillance of the people above them, but at least they don't have to worry about being attacked while they sleep. It's not even a gilded cage, it's just a slightly less shitty cage. Notably, it is also a more isolating cage. The contestants have the opportunity to discuss the game and form alliances due to their communal living situation while the jumpsuits must adhere to strict regulation regarding when they can speak. They're not even allowed to show their faces. There's a reason the minor affluence of the middle class doesn't seem to make people's lives less miserable. There's an interesting intentionality to the game's facility being both a prison and a school, making this potentially the most Foucault-pilled show of the year. Foucault has infamously been immortalized as the schools are like prisons guy, but what he means when he draws a comparison between schools and prisons, which sounds kind of hyperbolic on its face, is that these two things, and indeed many other examples such as workplaces, contain within them a similar structure. A similar control over how you dress, where you go, how you act, when and how you can speak, and importantly to us, all of them function to reproduce ideology. What do I mean by that? Well, this is where off-brand Amon comes in. The masked man is one of the few voices you actually get to hear from the management section of the facility. He does not revel in the bloodshed of the game, nor does he seem particularly sympathetic to the contestants who have died. He speaks with a detached, rehearsed kind of PR rhetoric that is chilling in how familiar it is. Sure, we're killing you. Sure, we've taken advantage of you at your lowest point, but we're giving you an opportunity, a fair chance to make it in this world. Does that bullshit sound familiar? Squid Game very heavy-handedly shows you what it thinks about that kind of ideological justification in this scene where that rhetoric is juxtaposed with hanging corpses. Of course, just as it is out there in the real world, all this talk about fairness and meritocracy is a lie. The games tend to be significantly luck-based. Take, for example, the Candy Shape game in which contestants arbitrarily choose a shape that they only later find out they'll have to carve out of a thin piece of sugar candy without breaking it. If you happened to be a triangle, you'd have a much, much easier time than if you happened to be an umbrella. What's fair about that? It seems more like who wins and who loses is determined largely by complete chance before the game even starts. Oh, I see what they did there. That's clever. Some people are better at some things. Some of the contestants might have had skills or knowledge from their regular lives that helped them in some of the games. So it was never really possible to have a completely equal starting point in these games. What's interesting is that the people running the game seem to pick and choose when a contestant using their own skills and knowledge to get ahead is acceptable and when it isn't. Using your knowledge of playground games to get ahead. Fine. Using your medical training to secure advantages for yourself. Not so fine. Using your background in organized crime to form a gang and coordinate attacks on other players. Fine. 
using your background in glass production to figure out which plane of glass is reinforced and which will break if you step on it, not so fine. Something that really stands out about that last example is the masked man, who has up until this point been going on about how fair everything is, actively changes the parameters of a game partway through just to entertain these guys. We should talk about these fucking guys. With gloriously hammy acting and even worse outfits, these guys are the money behind the madness. They pay up enormous sums, presumably financing the victory pot, so that they can watch the game as entertainment. One of them thinks it's boring that a few extra people will survive the glass plane game because of this man's knowledge of glass. So the rules are changed to make it more fun for him. This is where we come to the ways that Squid Game is not just a critique of capitalism, but a specific reflection on South Korean capitalism. See, South Korea didn't rapidly become what we in the West consider a all by itself. They had help from the West. American interests supported South Korea as a straight-up dictatorship until just a few decades ago as a bulwark in the region against the North and others. South Korea's history with capitalist development is specifically a history of American state control, rendering their government often little more than a US puppet, and Western financial interests dictating the direction of their economy. So these guys aren't just the rich guys behind the game, they are specifically foreign, white, Western money, watching poor Koreans kill each other for a laugh. We've talked a lot about the antagonists in this story, the rich foreign backers, the mouthpiece that sells the ideological justification for their violence, the enforcers and the managers, but who is our protagonist in this story? Gihon is presented in the first couple episodes as a classic deadbeat dad. He's divorced, lost custody of his daughter, and seems to be severely in debt to organized criminals due to his gambling addiction. He is a figure that many in the audience might not feel a lot of sympathy for at first. Especially with the way addiction continues to be treated as a personal failing rather than an illness. But in episode 5, something happens. Gihun experiences a PTSD flashback to himself and other striking workers being brutally beaten by police. He witnesses a co-worker beaten to death right before his eyes. These events are a direct reference to the Sangyong Motors strike in 2009. Now this strike went on for 77 days in direct response to the company, without warning, laying off 43% of its workforce, that's thousands of people, as a result of being purchased by global investors. These workers were simply jettisoned, as it was viewed as the best financial decision by people somewhere else with an incredible amount of money. The strikers were violently suppressed and beaten by the police. But what's more is the strikers were blacklisted from other large Korean employers for daring to stand up for themselves. As if that wasn't enough, Sangyong and the police collaborated to sue the strikers based on harsh anti-union laws and imposed fines on the workers of the equivalent of 9 million US dollars. This was an amount no worker could ever pay, and so their wages, their homes, anything else of value they might own, were seized by the courts and given to the company that had ruined them and the police that had brutalized them. These people were financially ruined, unemployable and saddled with debt they could never hope of paying off. There's been dozens of suicides among these workers and their families in the years since. This is the side of South Korea that we don't get to see much of here in the West. They're sold to us as this well-off democracy in the region, in stark contrast to the spooky bad guys in the North. But the truth is significantly uglier. Returning to Gihon, we start to see him in a different light. He lost his family because he could no longer support them. It's possible it was even a mutual decision between him and his wife. After all, if they stayed married, all that debt would be transferred to her if he died. 
his addictive behavior, his gambling, this all starts to make sense when we realize this man is not only deeply traumatized by the violence he's witnessed, but his ability to get legitimate work will have been sabotaged by the company as well. And so Squid Game invites us to have a little more understanding for people whose situations might not just be down to being bad people who made bad choices. That seems like a good thought on which to shift to another character, the North Korean defector Kang Sibyuk. Defectors from the North are often considered lucky. People who have gotten away from tyranny and found a land of freedom and opportunity. Sometimes they're even paid exorbitant sums of money to come to the West and say basically anything they want about the North. We've got an audience primed to uncritically accept it. And there's a train waiting area, and North Korea has one train go to one distance like a once a month. <laughs> and like here it would take like one hour to go to the other place. In North Korea it would take a month at least to go because there's no electricity. And sometimes people have to push the train. They have to push the train. Yeah. A narrative you don't tend to see as much is about defectors from the North who want to go back. They can't, by the way. Once they're accepted into South Korea, they become South Korean citizens and therefore legally barred from entering the North. Many of these so-called defectors are actually the result of human trafficking, and half of the 30,000-odd North Koreans living in the South say they are subject to discrimination from employers colleagues, and even strangers on the street. One northerner living in the south, Kim Ryonhui, finds herself living in much worse conditions than she ever did in the north. And when asked why she doesn't try to have her daughter smuggled to the south, she said, Living here for seven years taught me what it really is like to live here as a North Korean defector. North Korean defectors are forever strangers in this country classified as second-class citizens. I would never want my daughter to live this life. And North Korean defectors are treated like cigarette ashes thrown away on the streets. A little different from the story we tend to hear, isn't it? This is what makes Sebyuk's character so interesting. The fact that she's here in the game kind of tells us everything we need to know about how life in the South is going for her. This is further emphasized by this scene, in which a contestant she's befriended asks her, is it better here? And she says, nothing. This is important because the National Security Act in South Korea actually bans saying anything positive about the North. If she had said, no, it's not better here, the creators of the show could face severe legal consequences. Honestly, I'm amazed how close to the sun they flew on this one, because even though she doesn't say it, the meaning of the scene is pretty obvious. It is significant for a piece of media in a country with laws like that to make the statement that for people from the North, Despite the South being so much richer on paper, despite whatever problems the North might have, this is not better. All that money in the South isn't going to regular people, it's going to these guys. For the defectors, they're still in prison here with everyone else. There are other things specific to South Korea in this show, but I'm only pointing these out to highlight what Squid Game says about this country that we in the West often receive such a whitewashed image of. Not to try to tell you that you're somehow wrong for relating to the themes in this show if you're an American or European. To bring up Bong Joon-ho again, it's like he says, we all live in the same country. Capitalism. Ultimately, gi is the only contestant to survive the game. In the final episode, he makes one last wager with the founder of the game, the old man who had been posing as a real contestant, a tourist to the suffering of the poor for his own amusement, never in any real danger himself. The wager is simple. There's a homeless man on the street outside, sure to freeze to death if nobody helps him. The old man bets that nobody will help. Gihon bets that somebody will. Gihon still believes in people. The police couldn't beat it out of him with their clubs. The government couldn't wring it out of him with their anti-union debt traps. The game couldn't steal it from him as he watched people ruthlessly turned against one another for the amusement of the wealthy and powerful. Through all of that, he still believes somebody will help this man. He still believes in other people. The foundational idea of a union. 
that we can trust each other, that we can help each other, and that we are stronger together than we would ever be alone. Gion is not the new Soviet man, because we are not in those heady days in the wake of a revolution, imagining how to build a new society. We are a people deeply disempowered and entrenched in a capitalist system. However, Gion does represent an ideal kind of person, a post-Soviet man, if you will. A person so committed to their belief in other people, so resistant to the cynicism that everything in their life tries to force onto them, the very cynicism that leads to reactionary apathy, to becoming the sort of person who sees someone dying in the streets and says, oh well, shit happens. Somebody with that kind of unshakable mental fortitude, but not a perfect person. Gion is not immune to his circumstances. He has stolen to feed his gambling addiction. He has lied and manipulated to save his own life. But despite knowing from experience how shitty people can be, he still believes in other people. If the new Soviet man was the ideal person in the early days of an attempt to build a new, better kind of society, then the post-Soviet man is the ideal person in an era after the collapse of that dream. When we are taught to see creating a better world as an impossible, naive fantasy, that is the kind of person we should be striving to be. Because even though Gion gets out, wins that life-changing amount of money, and gains the ability to turn his back on the world. He goes back to stop the game at the end of the final episode. He refuses to walk away knowing that people are still being hurt. Because that's the kind of guy he is. A union man. He was more than a hero. He was a union man. Somebody does come to help the homeless man in the end, by the way. Oh.